Okay. Our final panel of the day is delivering on the demand for transparency, which is being hosted by Orbit MI. And the reason it's on the program is because as the public's demand for transparency increases and digital tools are better able to provide data, what is the best mechanism for delivering transparency to ensure shipping, shipping's social license to operate? Here to set the stage for our next roundtable is Orbit CEO, Orbit MI CEO, Ali Riaz. Ali? Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? It's good? All right. Um, thank you so much and uh, for the introduction. Happy to be here. Uh, my name is Ali Riaz. I am the CEO at Orbit MI, and we are delighted to be a sponsor uh, for this uh, wonderful conference. Wonderful to see people live, as many have mentioned, and also uh, for uh, hosting the panel discussion uh, on transparency. Uh, we all experience a very fascinating time in maritime industry. The industry has been siloed and fragmented for decades, perhaps centuries, uh, and now data transparency is on the agenda. One of the things we at Orbit MI bring to the maritime is depth of experience in understanding digital transformation in other industries. I'd like to share some of those experiences because I believe that there is a light in the tunnel and it's not another train. Um, the, 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 the key, uh, key areas that I have personally witnessed digital transformation and transparency has been in financial services, software business, and life sciences. What all of these industries had in common is that in order to undergo transformation, they had to grapple with the issue of transparency transparency in terms of what information to share, what information to protect, how do you track what information you provided to somebody, and how do you safeguard information that somebody's providing to you, and hundreds of more questions. What was common among all these three industries I mentioned is that they faced pressures from government, regulators, financial institutions, insurance companies, and the public. Sounds familiar, right? So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. When I was at Novartis Pharmaceutical, it was the early days of cloud computing. Basically, no more company uh, data centers or you know, rooms that are locked with uh, servers inside of it, but actually taking all your content and making it, storing it uh, for access and analytics in the cloud that's shared with the rest of the world. And I remember the conversations in-house that we will never adopt cloud. We absolutely thought that was a ridiculous thought and we're never going to put clinical trial data in the cloud. Today, if you can find a company that has data centers or server rooms, you should really uh, give them some kind of medal for um, longevity in their beliefs because that doesn't exist. So something that obvious that we're never going to put clinical trial data is now in the cloud. And what was really interesting was that we found out that the cloud actually was safer because it has a collective wisdom of you know a lot of the different clients that uh, are using it, but also the, the provider of those different clouds have expertise in data safety and cybersecurity and all those things. In the software business, which I've spent most of my time in, um, back in the days, people were very proud of their black boxes. You know, this is our technology, no, we, you know, nobody can access it, nobody, you know, it's special, it's a black box. Today, in technology world, a black box is a red flag. Um, uh, any software package that does not have open APIs, does not willingly um, uh, integrate with other software uh, assets, is really not going to survive. 
it's got to complete 180. And I think in financial services, which is probably one of the biggest areas when it comes to regulatory and compliance, we have many examples of companies trying to meet regulatory reporting the hard way. Take, for instance, the impact of Dodd-Frank in financial services. Suddenly, firms needed to create and gather paper trails for nearly every transaction. But the technologies did not exist, so what did they do? They hired interns, part-time workers, and they shoved them in the basement and had them go through all of those emails and documents manually and create spreadsheets. And that lasted for 29 days. And then the backlog started for the next month and next month. So uh, that was uh, not successful, but that's also why a lot of compliance has been automated in the financial services world. A dialogue on transparency is essential and hopefully will lead to more companies being better prepared. The key here is to understand that transformation and transparency does not happen at scale unless technology is fast to deploy, easy to use, and designed to be future-proof. Uh, so with that, it's a good segue to Orbit. I'll quickly give you our information. We are actually a corporate spin-off out of Stena Bulk, a Swedish ship owner. Stena wanted to use technology to deal with the increased volatility in all areas of the business, from weather, regulatory, geopolitics, pretty much every area. Orbit is an operating system for anyone interested in voyage profitability and sustainability. And being a pure software as a service solution, meaning that we have no hardware or downloads, we offer our clients an easy way to test the benefits that we claim and easily adopt the technology in the areas of uh, operations, field management, chartering, and compliance, to mention a few. Now I'd like to turn it over to David Levy, Chief Marketing Officer of Orbit MI, who will be moderating this panel. Thank you. Just so there's no confusion, I put my name over Ali's. Um, people mistake the two of us for each other all the time. Um, in any case, uh, thanks, Ali. Uh, I, too, come from uh, a couple of more traditional industries, magazine publishing, advertising, and also software where I met Ali. Um, and there's, there's some pattern recognition that happens when these companies go through digital transformation. But, but what I wanted to do in terms of moderating this panel is I wanted to frame the discussion a little bit at the conceptual level about transparency. And then I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves quickly, and then I will start in with some questions. We did a prep call uh, on Friday, I think it was, and before you knew it, we had spent about 30, 35 minutes, so I'm not really worried about filling up the time with content here. Uh, it's going to be more the case of people like passing out because they're hungry. Um, but just uh, let me just, according to my rough calculations, um, today, we've used the word transparency 4,472,316 times, okay? We say the word transparency a lot, um, and I thought it might be helpful for us to maybe talk a little bit about what transparency is and what transparency is not. Um, and in a lot of cases, transparency, especially in a, a traditional industry, causes us to clutch our pearls and to be afraid. Like transparency, are you talking about me sharing all of my industry secrets, my customer data, my pricing? What else am I supposed to be sharing? What, what do you mean by transparency? And that idea and those fears actually are blockers to progress. And so, so one of the first things that we did as a, a company of three, three or four years ago is we commissioned a white paper called Sharing and Shipping. And we wanted to reframe the notion of sharing in the context of it being an opportunity. And the, the economists that we hired crunched some numbers and they said in the next seven years, so probably now about five years, that just 
by becoming more transparent, sharing data, and collaborating, the, sh the global shipping industry can generate $237 billion in incremental value. Okay, $237 billion in incremental value. They, you know, we can get them on stage and they can tell you how they did that, but it's not zero, maybe it's not $237 billion, but there's an opportunity there for everyone to share and to be more transparent. And in, in that context, transparency has a couple of different components, uh, and Ali mentioned them uh, briefly here. There's an art to transparency, and there's a science to transparency. And the science to transparency is a little bit easier to define. It's what to share, what not to share. Right? Where is the data? Who has access to the data? Right? What are we legally allowed to share? What are the documents we need that can protect ourselves? Data security, confidentiality, these are the, the, the aspects of the science of transparency. They're just the rules to follow. But there's also the art of transparency, and that has to do with company culture. That has to do with company culture. So how, when, why do we behave in a transparent way? Who do we share with? Who do we not share with? Why and when should we be transparent? Some of these things are not necessarily clear. There is less of a rule book. But there is, there's some guideposts here. If you're a publicly traded company, there are some requirements put on you to be transparent. There's filings you need to do on a quarterly and annual basis. Right? We can talk about whether that's enough. But being a publicly traded company, doesn't. It, you're not the only company or type of company that can be transparent. Privately held companies can also have a culture of transparency. And good for us, we've got representatives of both a privately held company and a publicly held company, pretty big ones too, that can talk through their experiences there. But we've also talked about waiting for regulators right, to do things to cause us to act. And the fact of the matter is, I think we all realize we can't wait, right? The industry can't wait. We need to start acting today. And so private companies have created these different consortiums, many of whom are represented here today, the Blue Sky Maritime Coalition. We've got a, a, someone you may recognize from the NAMEPA here. There's also representatives of Global Maritime Forum. Uh, and there's also a lesser known one called Get Set Maritime, which is a group of maritime software companies, including many people over here, uh, DTN, uh, Nautilus Labs, Kongsberg, Sedna, who have banded together to create an industry group that is designed to help the ship owners and operators to understand how to purchase software and how to evaluate it. So there's a lot of ways that we can get to this notion of transparency. Um, and what I'd like the panel to do is to, to take us from this conceptual level and down into the industry level and then eventually into the company level and talk about um, maybe what happens in the company and then we'll talk about some of the technologies that enable transparency, okay? So why don't we start from here? I'd like you to introduce yourselves really quickly, and then I've got my first question teed up for you, uh, Sturgio, so you just be, be prepared, okay? <laughs> so hello, everybody. My name is Sturgio Stamopoulos. I'm the manager of sustainability for the ABS America Sustainability Center. I've been with ABS for 15 years. I've changed many roles and many hats in my career with ABS. The Sustainability Center for Americas is one of the five centers that ABS has globally. And we are looking at sustainability, not only decarbonization, from one spectrum to the other, from regulatory compliance, supporting our clients, to you know decarbonization itself, technologies, alternative fuels, all the way to the more exotic areas of sustainable finance, sustainable procurement, sustainable reporting, and so on. So I'm happy to be at this panel and talk about transparency. Good. Thank you, Stergios, with an S. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Don't get me sad. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Jan Willem van den Dijssel, as it's pronounced. Um, 
I've been with Cargill for 25 plus years. Um, it's the, the largest private company in the United States, so thanks for the call out. Um, we do not need to be non-transparent just because we're private, but it is a fair comment because when 2004, when I left the US for Geneva, that office for 30 years did not have a sign above the door. <laughs> Kind of was necessary, I guess. Anyway, um, so what do we do within Cargill? 155,000 employees, and uh, we, we, we bring feed and food to animals. We connect farmers with markets and transform ingredients for customers, basically. But we're in the ocean transportation, so I am in the ocean transportation part. And if you like numbers, here we go. With over 300 colleagues, we spend about five and a half billion dollars to transform time charters, fuel, and port costs to move 217 million tons of goods on about 700 plus ships on any given day uh, to over 250 customers in over 70 countries. So that's a very large player, um, if not the largest in ocean freight. This is basically 200 million tons of dry bulk and another 15 million tons of liquid products. So just to give you an idea of how big that is, I went to uh, um, a merchant academy and I said, you know, our fleet is bigger than which Navy? And they all, like, oh. <laughs> it's a few combined. <laughs> um, anyways, I'll pass it on to Michael. Sure. Uh, Michael Gravett, I'm, uh, I'm responsible for DTN's um, business in the Americas. Uh, I'm, the, I think, the scientist up here, uh, a meteorologist. I've spent about uh, a little over 20 years uh, dealing with weather risk and voyage optimization, and, and just a little bit about what CTN does. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm going to hear the collective eyes rolling when I use these buzzwords, but uh, the data analytics and, and technology company. But what that means is basically we work in multiple pillars, agriculture, energy, um, mining, and weather risk. Um, and, and we really take data, there's 1,200 employees uh, globally, we take data and the information and really create um, uh, operational uh, insight, right? So it's uh, uh, r really relevant for this discussion, I think, in terms of taking information and, and really driving value. I think the one other thing we can all collectively agree on is uh, the always trust the weatherman. So we're, we're <laughs> at least 50%. Yeah, yeah, 50%. Yeah, 50, yeah, right. Excellent. Hi, I'm Carlene Leiden Walker. And uh, yes, I am Shipping Insight, and yes, I am Namepa, and, and I'm also Morgan Marketing and Communications. And, and I got my start in advertising, public relations, and marketing. And one of the first things I learned, I was at Ogilvy and Mather Advertising. And Dave, I actually knew David Ogilvy. He, he thought I was a cute young blonde thing, and maybe then I was. But he, one of his catchphrases was, the consumer isn't an idiot, she's your wife. And his thesis was that it is important to always tell the truth. It is important to be well researched. He was a big research guy. It turns out he was a British spy during World War II, but oh well. But I would love to see the spirit and the and the action of transparency come into our industry because I love our industry. I think we've got a noble, wonderful industry that has an incredible value proposition to global society, but we don't talk about it. We don't tell people about it. And I, I'm also going to fess up. Normally event managers don't tell you what their challenges are. They just tell you everything's wonderful. I asked five different ship owners to be on this panel. Jan Willem said yes, and Rich Pruitt said yes. The others said no. Why would we want to be transparent? Why do we want to argue for transparency? I said, at the very least, talk about what your SEC declarations are. I mean, we're not talking about commercial secrets. And I guess I'm just, so I'm grateful to both Jan Willem and to Rich for being on this panel. I also, Jan Willem, I mean, again, I'm in marketing, so I know about spin. I've known you all these years as Jan Willem Vanden Diesel. Are you greening your name? Uh, <laughs> I was asked once if I was Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, I'm Rich Pruitt, and uh, I'm responsible for environmental operations and sustainability at Carnival Cruise Line, which is one of the brands of Carnival Corporation and PLC. Um, and before the pandemic, Carnival Corporation was the world's largest leisure travel company in the world. I'm not sure where it is after that. Um, it has over 100,000 employees, both shipboard and shoreside. Um, I want to say in the 90-something ships right now, it's changing constantly. Um, and uh, I also get the opportunity to work with the corporation um, on things like uh, sustainability initiatives, uh, technology evaluations, and uh, most recently working on the, the private destinations and ports and terminals uh, that we operate around the world. And I'm happy to be here because Carlene made me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks, everyone. Um, as I mentioned, we had a great prep call last last Friday, and there are a couple of great quotes that came out of that, and I'm going to tee one up for you, Sturgios, and hopefully you say what I hope you're going to say. If not, I'm going to say it for you. But the first question here to you is, what do you believe is the appetite for transparency in, in the shipping industry? Great question. Appetite. We're very close to dinner. <laughs> Diet. So. Uh, I'll start with kind of question to the audience. Everybody, I guess, not everybody, but everybody wants to lose weight without going through the diet process. So transparency is like everybody wants to have the benefits of transparency mm -hmm. without going through the process of being transparent. Okay? And transparency, talking about the appetite, is a new word in our vocabulary. Uh, although we did hear it four million times today. Yes. Okay. So, and mainly it's because data security, am I going to reveal my company's, you know, insights to the outside world? Uh, but I think the focus to increase the appetite is to look at the benefits. And if we, if we don't do it ourselves, other people will make us have this appetite in the sense that there are, ex there are common internal drivers and external drivers for transparency. For example, a lot of companies go through the journey of having sustainability reports where they have to disclose all their data or the data that are required by the different frameworks. Very few of them actually have these sustainability reports and data assured. Uh, CDP, the Global um, uh, Disclosure Project. Um, there is pressure for many companies um, in the value chain to disclose a lot of their internal workings, e, the, e, the, e, the S's and the G's of the ESG framework to CDP, pressure from, you know, the clients to their value chain, to their vendors, because they themselves need to show that they're transparent, that they're sustainable. Um, the new initiatives this morning or this noon, we talked about the shipping corridors, the green shipping corridors. And these corridors to work, there is a demand for cooperation, different stakeholders in the value chain, to be on the same page. So that means that there has to be transparency between all these partners in addressing all the fundamental elements of the green shipping corridor. So again, going back and not talking all the time, is we need to focus as an industry on the benefits of transparency. Uh, we need to think about transparency with an open mind. And I guess the benefits outweigh the difficulties that a company might face going through that journey. Okay. I, I want to uh, give the same question. I'm, I'm switching the script. Okay. Um, I want to give the same question in, in terms of the appetite to transparency to our, our, our two ship owners. And I want to ask you first, Rich, what do you, what do you believe the, the appetite for transparency in the shipping industry is? And if you wanted to talk about Carnival's position on that, that would be great. Yeah, it's, it's tough for me to talk about it from anything other than the cruise lines, right? Because um, that's, that's what I know the best. 
Um, and we have a different type of a perspective because there's not many shipping lines that are so guest facing, or I should say uh, customer facing, right? So in order for us to, you know, to attract guests, attract uh, finances, et cetera, um, you know, there are financial analysts that are constantly asking us for, for environmental performance data. Um, we also do CDP. We do the GRI for our sustainability reports. We're, we're working along the sustainable development goals, et cetera, and, and we report those. Um, so for us, it's, it's kind of a different uh, proposition because, you know, we are so public facing. Um, uh, but, you know, we also have our a board of directors, um, you know, we have our institutional investors who are asking for this. Um, we get asked by, I, literally yesterday I was asked by one of our ports to disclose what our, what our emissions factors were for the, the time that we were in their county. Um, and, and of course, we'll disclose that. And that's not the first time that's happened. It's happened several times uh, when people want to do air emissions uh, inventories for their, for their areas. So it's, I, I think because it comes so often, we kind of, we, we do it, you know, because it's, there's no value in hiding it. Um, if you really want to be smart, um, somebody can dig into a, a, a whole host of information sources and find it. Um, and of course, when you do that, then you lose the opportunity to make sure it's accurate uh, and that, it's, that you're presenting it in the best light that you can. Yeah, I'm Willem, what's your thoughts? stick to the industry level first and I think I don't know if it got started by the uh, lower fuel in 2020 the 0.5 fuel that got the, the, the whole debate started and, and almost immediately we switched over to decarbonization and and to be honest I think it's it's I'll stick with the positive I think it's a it's galvanizing this industry and everybody's all over here talking about collaboration the need for you know we need we need everybody's input from the ports to the government's regulators etc I don't think we've seen quite such a reaction before. So maybe we don't want the mistakes that we had before. That, you know, so there's a lot of uncertainty and that's probably why. Um, but the challenges ahead are difficult enough if we're transparent. <laughs> Imagine if we're not gonna be transparent about it, it's going to be even more complicated, right? So I'll say that on, on, the, on the whole. On a company level, uh, I kind of joked about the, the previous name above the door, but there's a reason my boss, Jan Dillemann, is the head of the Global Maritime Forum. He's, he's got better things to do, you would think, you know, managing this, this business that we have. But our slogan, our strategy slogan internally is together making zero carbon shipping a reality. Because as big as we are, we know there's no way we're going to solve this by, solve this by ourselves. So we need the best and the brightest ideas from, from, from the universities to naval engineers to energy providers, et cetera, to make this happen. And faster, we want it to go faster than the IMO wants to go. So that's another thing. Um, so I will also say in terms of transparency, our first sustainability report I think came out in 2017 before there were even targets set. And we've learned, we've improved, we've made mistakes, we report our successes and our failures, and that's for everybody to see. You might be a private company, but that's out there. Um, we shout out to NAMEPA, they, they have a review. If, if you haven't done it, you can run your sustainability report through NAMEPA's review, and it's basically a tool to see what you might have missed. It's not a, it's not a grading, but it, we also found things that we had forgotten or missed, so we improved it the next time. So, just a few examples. But you, you, you're saying something that recalls uh, a phrase that we, we heard recently, I think it was from uh, Richard Mead from Lloyd's List Intelligence, who was quoting someone else who said, you know, if you think compliance is expensive, try non-compliance, right? Um, in, 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 I want to throw it over to, to you, Carlene, uh, from now I want you to put on your Nemepa hat, right? What do you see some of the drivers of accelerating the need for transparency, uh, especially from the, the environmental point of view? Well, I think naturally the public is driving the regulators. Um, the public awareness about climate change is driving their choices. It's beginning to drive their choices. 
Their choices are impacting charterers, and those charterers still want a lower rate, but they're starting to look around and demand environmental performance so that their chain, their logistics chain, is optimized so that they can, the Walmarts of the world, because as it was said earlier, at some point soon, you're going to have a choice between ordering from Amazon and getting it tomorrow and getting it three days from now and saving how many tons of CO2. That's how we're going to start measuring the cost of goods. We still don't have end-to-end, -end, but if we can quantify the logistics chain, then there are going to be decisions made. The public is getting closer and closer and closer to our industry. And I want our industry to shine, and we can. We have to recognize, I mean, there are you know, publicly traded companies. They're answering to shareholders. More and more shareholders are getting to be activist shareholders. Let's take a look at Shell, Chevron, ExxonMobil last year. Their shareholders were demanding an attention to the environment. Let's take a look at what happened during COVID to our mariners. Our mariners hit mainstream media because they were caught up in the COVID restrictions. Let's take a look at corporate governance issues. Well, who can escape the headlines if they're going to jail or if they've been slapped with indictments? As an industry, we are a noble industry. We're a good industry, and we are providing an invaluable service. We have to act that way and be willing to tell people we're acting that way. Rich, as he said, is consumer-facing. But to a greater and greater extent, all of us are consumer-facing because these demands for transparency are here. Thank you, Carlene. If, if I may add to Carlene, it's, it's already stated, when we talk about transparency, everybody's talking about the E side of the ESGs, and a lot of times they're forgetting the S and the G, the people, you know, uh, working conditions. You know, during COVID, when people were stranded on ships, the governance of companies. So this is something that needs to be repeated more often. Mm -hmm. So not just emissions and decarbonization. Right. Um, Michael, I want to get you in here. Um, I'll have a question. I think I'll have a follow-up. Your technology, as we've spoken about throughout the day, is important to all of these issues around compliance, around uh, transparency. What are some of the things that you see that uh, as technology as being an enabler of transparency? Sure. Um, well, to, to, to kind of deconstruct that, meteorology um, has been on the forefront of, say, transparent data for a long time. They, uh, uh, big data coming in because the, from companies like ours, we want to understand that we have confidence in the information that comes in so that we can provide confidence to the end user, right? And, and so by having that initial, say, understanding and appreciation for the taking that data, that information, and knowing where it's coming from and being able to provide insights to that, um, what we're seeing now is the, the ability to just crunch more and more information, right? And so, so to come to your question about technology, um, I, I, there was a, I, I think it was Ali mentioned uh, about cloud computing and, and racks and that used to exist and now that, that just simply, and, and from, from our side of the business, um, this, this, even just in the last five years, the, the, the change in technology, the, the ability to process information and pull out value is, is just making things much more accessible and, and, um, and having companies be able to create more value from them, right? So I, I think um, what we're seeing is, is, is it's facilitating the ability for, uh, for insight on that, is, is technology. Yeah, one of the things that we had spoken about in, in our, our call earlier was that sometimes within a company itself, there's no transparency. 
meaning one department has got a bunch of data over here, another department's got a, a bunch of data over here, there's a silo over there, there's another system over there, and so even within the company, there's a lack of transparency. On the other side, you have the fact that there's so much data out there, and you can get, I think what we talked about is the irony of too much data, like rain, and there's too much data, too much transparency, and now suddenly you can't see anything, right? Mike, you, you had mentioned this idea of the auditability of, of sure. data. Could you talk to me a little bit, of, talk to us a little bit about what, what you meant by that? Yeah, yeah. well, and, and you touched on it with, with just a, such an immense amount of information that's, that's now being collected, right? And, and one of the earlier panels, uh, someone had mentioned that, well, we can have all this data if we don't know what to do with it, what value is it, right? We hear that data is the new, the next gold mine, but what can you get from this? And in part with that is the, the collection, the archiving, the accessibility of that data, right? Because uh, again, on, on meteorology and in ship performance, we've talked about this uh, kind of transparency, um, I, I, where understanding how weather impacts vessels, how it, whether it's warranted performance, demonstrated performance, right? And you want to be able to go back and, and look at that information and, and see, access the, that archived mm -hmm. information, right? So, so being able to, uh, and I th again, cloud computing is, is a big reason that makes it uh, available, accessible, uh, to be able to go back and, and look at this, uh, this data. Now you're touching upon something that I, I want to throw this open to the group. Um, which is being transparent is great, but being accurate, being truthful, and also having some enforcement mechanisms against what people are being transparent about is also another aspect of, of how we're going to move forward as an agency, um, as an industry, pardon me. So comment, if you would, about things uh, it's like, how do we enforce transparency? What are the mechanisms that we need to need to be in place to make sure that as data is shared and people collaborate, there's a good set of rules there, and what we can we can trust what is out there and what is being shared. I can start the discussion on that. Uh, the two elements on it. First, the company itself needs to have. How do we enforce? The company itself has to have in its DNA the need to what data it provides out there that these data are verified, these data are truthful. I don't need to bring examples of, I'll go back to the sustainability reports where you read sustainability reports that are out there, they do have some data and they present a picture that you know it's clearly you know, not correct. So nobody's gonna believe this. And then there should be regulatory, I guess, mechanisms, penalties for not, you know, when there is a need for data uh, sharing or transparency in general, there should be mechanisms that, you know, penalize those who try to cheat the system. Yeah. No, I can add to that. I think one of the reasons we were on the, on the Maritime Forum is with the sea cargo charter, we tried to get more parties on board as an industry to define how we're gonna measure this stuff. Because if everybody goes off on their own, charters, owners, operators, you name it, it's going to be impossible to comply with everybody. That's just, so that's one thing. So we invite everybody to join and have a say. Because if, if we don't come up with some communal standard, it's gonna be mayhem. And we've already seen from some customers that they want their emissions stated in a particular way, depending on their industry. For anyone to comply with a myriad of different things is complicated, that's one. As to the enforcement, mm, I think we, we need to move forward. If we're gonna worry now about the enforcement of certain things, I, I think we need to keep the positivity. If we start criticizing everybody, what they're doing, I think that's, that's not what we need at this particular stage to be that honest. I mean, we've done, we've, we've had sky sales, maybe some of you know, we tried that 10 years ago, it utterly failed. But I know a Japanese competitor is going to start again and we wish them all the luck. And we mean it, we need solutions. So just because it didn't work for us, maybe it works for somebody else. You know, we've reported what works, what doesn't. 
And I would say to the, on the company level, yeah, I heard, I like the black box idea. It's like, yeah, it's black, but you can't see what's in it. So I think we have some of that software, unfortunately. But we will need the data, and we will need to share the data. Because without that, I think you said that, the Carleen, you, you can't make decisions and policies. So, and we're still in that phase of developing stuff. So that's, I think, good enough reason to, to share. Yeah, I, I agree with what, uh, what Jan Willem just said. I mean, you know, there's the saying about don't fashion the rod that somebody beats you with. So if people are with good faith or are putting out information and trying to be transparent on their performance, they certainly shouldn't be attacked or have that information used to attack them. So, um, and, uh, and, and to Sturgio's point, if, if we're going to penalize people for, let's call it flawed transparency, I hope we start with politicians. Um, <laughs> So, but uh, you know, I, I think one of the things, so from, as a publicly traded corporation, um, s some of our requirement to make sure that we're accurate, and, and I can tell you I spent a lot of time triple and quadruple checking data before we put it out in sustainability reports, because if we're not, and we knowingly put out something, even if it's not in a 10K or a 10Q, um, we could be, you know, uh, there could be an allegation of market manipulation. So there are, some, there are some structural things that help make sure transparency is accurate. But the other thing is, you know, in working with people at the top, uh, you're, you're talking about, you know, Fortune 50 CEOs um, and brand presidents who they certainly would not want to have it out there that they were passing information, even knowingly or unknowingly, that they were putting out information that was, that was false. Does any I, of this, I, Carlin, go ahead. I just want to bring this to a, a very simple operational level. Why in God's name do we still have MARPOL 1 violations? I mean, our Coast Guard, unique in the world, I think, has you know, done a fine job of identifying these issues and turning them over to the D Department of Justice, and the Department of Justice has prosecuted. We have a very strong port state control in, this, in, the, in our United States Coast Guard, and I'm very proud of them and the work they do. More of that needs to be done. We, op, we are a global industry, and not all port states are like that. We're not getting enforcement from a lot of flag states. If people think they can get away with it, maybe they will try. But we are better than that, and particularly with the increase in digitalization that gives us the tools for identifying scoff laws, if you will. It, it's just, it has to stop, but it will stop. And we can start in a proactive, positive way and say, yeah, I want to adopt this. Or we can wait for the Coast Guard to find it. So that's on the operational level. Why do we still have MARPOL 1 violations? Let me ask one more question and then we'll take, or should we take questions from the audience? What do you think? Um, I have one question. This is great. We're now 4,472,329 mentions of transparency today. Um, <laughs> what, do we th what are the barriers to transparency that we see that we know we need to knock down? I would say culture. Corporate culture and a conservative, in a conservative inter industry. Anyone else? Uh, I think from this, say, solutions provider technology point of view, uh, the hope that I think we can take from this is what, what we've seen in the last, it's specific to the maritime uh, sector, uh, the lockdown was a real, um, say, catalyst for embracing digital in, in shipping, right? And, and what came out of that is a really strong share to gain mentality uh, amongst the providers, right? And, and so this, this jack of all trades, master of none, is, is going the, the way of the dinosaur. And you see a lot of companies that, are, that know what their lane is and what their value is, and they're finding, I, I think, again, sorry, um, APIs make this more uh, possible, platform technology make this more po possible. So I really think that, um, uh, once that creates a, a strong commercial value, um, it, it, 
that's when the, the sector is really going to understand the commercial value of transparency. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Do we have any questions from the audience and microphones that will be passed around? We've got a question here. Hold on, we've got microphone runners. It's the old Phil Donahue show. Here we go. Run, Megan, run. It's a race, like beat the clock. <laughs> Mass maritime at your finest. <laughs> Um, hi, uh, my, I'm Captain Jennifer Norwood. Um, I come from the oil and gas industry. Um, by trade, I just want to ask a question. Um, we've talked about industry image, and do you think that is a blocker to the transparency? Because when we talk about transparency, are we really, what we're, what we're boiling it down to is integrity and ethics and leadership, right? But when we don't want to be transparent, is it because of fear, fear that we might find something or the public might find something out about us? I, can, I, feel, I think it's fear of the unknown for those mm -hmm. companies, fear of the, you know, e, you know I know cases where uh, we cannot disclose this X, Y, and Z because then our competitor, oh, sorry, that our competitor will see, you know, our greenhouse gas emissions, our scope one emissions, scope two emissions. So they, they're still in the industry some fear of the unknown, you know, in be, being transparent might, which in most cases, you know, in most cases, not the case. Do you want to add something else? I think yeah. another way is we need to think about our industry differently. We describe ourselves as a commodity. Right. Let's get out of that mindset. Each company is unique. Each ship is unique. We are providing a service. We can differentiate ourselves. Part of it is through transparency and by talking about the good things we're doing. So let's stop calling ourselves a commodity and let's start calling ourselves a valuable service to global trade and the public. I, I can add something which is kind of interesting. I picked up, somebody said it today, that um, we all get on planes, we all see the trucks drive around, nobody sees the ships. Mm. And I was just looking at, over mm. my shoulder here, and if there's one ship sector that people do realize, it's actually the cruise line. And secondly, I think their marketing budget is probably bigger than all of the other ship owners combined. So there is something to that. Right? I was going to say, we spend a lot of money to differentiate Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I would, I would say we're probably the exception to Carleen's rule. But, but there, there, there's something to it. I mean, when you say cruise ship, people know intuitively what that sort of looks like. A balker, I, I still have to explain what a, what a balker is to many people. Um, but the need for it, I, I've said it, I think, in a previous conference, we need ambass be ambassadors for our trade, for sure. And I'll give everybody one example. We, have, we, have, we, ha we want more diversity in our company. Okay? We have set goals. By 2030, we have to have a management level parity. We're far from that. So we, we thought of jump-starting it and hiring people from, with previous um, experiences from other industries, commodities, banking, and brought them into shipping. The interesting thing, I sat down with three ladies in Geneva recently, and they said, how, so how's it going, and how did you get here? Well, they said, we reacted to a trading job, but we didn't know it was going to be in ocean transportation. To which I sort of followed up with the question, would you have applied if it said ocean transportation? And then they sort of, uh, uh, don't know. But that's, that's a serious issue. We, I mean, I've, I've told it to my boss's bosses, we deserve better talent, but we got to act and get it <laughs> and make that clear. Well, I have hope for you. Ah, because good. in two weeks at Namepa's 15th anniversary, there will be a book launch and more people will understand what a bulker is. Right. Well, we've uh, run out of time. Carlene gave me the sign. So thank you very much to all of our panelists for joining us today. Thank you for the opportunity to moderate, Carlene. And thank you for paying attention. I'm late.